Good afternoon. Welcome back to the conference room again. So in this session, we have uh, three presentation with all of them from uh, remote side. So uh, my co-chair is uh, Dr. Satya. Yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself? And then we will alternate. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Satya. I am uh, uh, from Hyderabad, India. I work for Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. So today I'm going to chair with uh, Professor Tawachai, sir. Then I'm very glad to chair this session. Okay. So then I would like to start with the first presentation uh, from India. Uh, Dr. Kalaya Lasan Laja. Uh, he is a surgeon uh, from Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, India. He also organized uh, one session in medical working group in a pan meeting. Uh, and today he will give a talk in the title of How Telemedicine Benefits Surgical Gastroenterology Patients. Uh, Dr. Raja, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Tawachar, for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, uh, we're also happy to uh, listen to you. And uh, also, Mr. Satya, uh, my good friend. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, share my presentation, which uh, uh, has actually the, uh, the recorded uh, audio. So... A very good evening to all. At the outset, I'd like to thank the Chemtech and the Organizing Committee of the Asia Telemedicine Symposium 2023 for the kind. Sir, we situation. can't see the video. Uh, sorry. Non oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, we I'll share again. Sorry. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, we can see. A very good evening to all. At the outset, I'd like to thank the Chemtech and the Organizing Committee of the Asia Telemedicine Symposium 2023 for the kind invitation. I'll be speaking on how telemedicine benefits surgical gastroenterology patients. Uh, greetings from uh, Jipmer, uh, which is uh, located in uh, Puducherry, which is a beautiful place in the southern part of uh, India, and uh, with a uh, lot of tourist attraction. And uh, I invite you all to uh, visit if you have the opportunity. In the next 12 minutes, I will give uh, a overview of the teleconsultation platform used in our center and uh, how it is uh, feasible and effective in patients uh, suffering from uh, disorders of the TI tract. We are all well aware of the devastating effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and the strain that it has posed on the global health care. However, with any challenge, comes new opportunities and the COVID-19 pandemic was an ideal platform to explore the telepatient gap. And that's the time we came out with a, a new video teleconsultation platform, which was a custom-made application developed using active server pages framework with visual basic at the core behind the language. It's key that the video consultation platform which we are using, we should be using a very minimal bandwidth to facilitate low bandwidth video consultation. And also the system should ensure that the secure channel for video consultation is closed and patient cannot use the same channel again 
once the definition of master call is entered. So these are the security features that we have been incorporated in the video consultation app. So this was uh, the teleconsultation app, which was uh, developed for booking appointments. And this is published uh, in the local language. And this is a typical example how the patient will view if they select a particular uh, department. And uh, to facilitate wider dissemination, this has also been uh, published in our website and the link also has been provided in the website. I'll briefly show how this video consultation really works. So as I had mentioned previously, the phone numbers are available to the patient. So the patients initiate the request for appointment by making a phone call. The phone call is received by a non-medical person who is posted in the medical registration department. So what he does is he will create an appointment based on the patient's request. The patient details are registered. And then, based on the complaints, the appointment is raised for a particular department and the specific surgeon. What the clinician does is, he goes to the scheduler workplace, then he confirms the appointment. After confirming the appointment, he will send a message to the patient which specifies the date and time to further video teleconsultation. Now, on the specific date and time, the video consultation is initiated by the doctor. So it is never initiated by the patient. It can never be done that way. This is to ensure security. So only the doctor will initiate it. And this is how the the platform will look like. So we just uh, did a, a, a study to analyze what is the feasibility of uh, the telemedicine in uh, surgical patients, because as we all know, um, uh, Sujitmar is a, a government funded hospital that primarily caters to poor patients. So it's important for us to objectively evaluate whether the telemedicine is feasible in our setup to the type of patients which the institute caters to. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, uh, study. Uh, we cannot hear the sound from the video. He still keep talking. Ah, eh? oh, Raja. No. He's sleeping. Uh, Dr. Raja, do you mute your microphone? But the, the voice just come from the video. Eh? Sir, can you please unmute, sir? You muted your mic. Yeah, the video taking consultation would not be completed. And when we analyze the reasons, why six five two behavior we initiate the video consultation, uh, the most common is because the majority did not have the smartphone and uh, they also had a poor network. And uh, because the message is sent to the patient and they need to be available on the specific date and time. And uh, we have found that almost in 20% of the times, the patients were not in a position to pick up the call and that's also something which uh, uh, the service is to initiate a video consultation. Um, the point to remember is because that was the time when uh, this 
video teleconsultation was initiated on a large scale basis. The patients were not tuned to this type of uh, uh, the patient care. And uh, when we repeated the feasibility analysis post COVID, so we have seen the success rate improved from 41.9%, uh, which was the stated that shown on the previous slide, to 72.8%. And this is primarily due to the wider availability of smartphones, better network connectivity. And these are the two things which happened post COVID. The patients and the common people realized the importance of having a smartphone and uh, mm -hmm. There is a tremendous movement in the network connectivity in the country in those period, and which obviously is in the positive outlook on the technological advances. And people realize the importance of technology uh, during the COVID 19 pandemic. And that's, uh, as I mentioned, one of the positive aspects of uh, the pandemic. Uh, we also analyzed the uh, effectiveness uh, in the uh, surgical patients, and uh, as you can, uh, so mainly in teleconsultation, we assess the effectiveness based on the satisfaction the level perceived by the patient. And these are the questionnaires uh, which have been asked during uh, the survey. And uh, if you see here, uh, so this is uh, on the 252 patients uh, who completed this. Uh, uh, the questionnaires, and uh, more than 60 percent felt it is good, uh, and 22 percent approximately uh, that it is average, and 15 percent were not satisfied. And then, when we analyzed uh, uh, what are the reasons for uh, uh, the patients that do not be fully satisfied with this teleconsultation, and what we found. When the teleconsultation is used as a modality for the initial consultation or the initial diagnostic workup. And that's where the patients who were planned for surgery, they prefer to have the consultation in person rather than through teleconsultation. Whereas for the follow up, patients find it more beneficial. And this is something which is probably different in surgical patients. The surgical patients are more comfortable with your daily consultation in the follow uh, rather than uh, for the initial consultation where they want to visit the physician and, uh, and get uh, their consultation. Uh, obviously, the follow up, when it involves just sharing only the blood investigations, the daily consultation is preferred compared to when you require some immediate uh, evaluation. Uh, finally, I'll end up with this. I think uh, India being such, such a vast country with a huge population, and to facilitate this patient care, we need the initiatives from the government. And finally, the government has come with this program of uh, uh, Aishman Bharat Health Authority Initiative, which gives a, a ID for a patient. So each citizen will get a unique ID. And the advantage of this is all the investigations, irrespective of the center where the patient gets the investigations, they are all stored under the patient's ID, depends upon whichever hospital. The patients can share their reports by just sharing their ID. And uh, because it's the patient's right to share the data, the patient will be receiving an OTP whenever they intend to share. And they will share that one-time password to the physician. And the physician can easily access the previous investigation reports, irrespective of the place where this has been done. And this is a major initiative by the government of India, and this will have uh, a potential to uh, facilitate uh, the telepatient care in the country. To conclude, telemedicine is feasible and effective in selected patients requiring super specialty care. And uh, 
the more innovation to focus on attention patient demands will improve the patient satisfaction in the future. Once again, and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's time for question or any comment. A time for question or comment from the audience. Is there any question? Uh, I have uh, one uh, quick short question about the, you said that 15% uh, of the patient is non-satisfaction, right? Non-satisfied yeah. from their survey. In your opinion, uh, what, what is the cause of unsatisfied? Of this. Yeah. So the, the main uh, reason is um, because when we use teleconsultation for their initial diagnosis and advice, so they are not because uh, they want the when we explain the surgical procedure over the teleconsultation, uh, they are not fully satisfied with that. So they want uh, the surgeon to explain them with some uh, pictures, drawing, and uh, so probably like when we explain in uh, in person, we used to draw the we draw pictures, show what are the parts removed, and uh, what how we are going to do the reconstruction. So that when we do by teleconsultation, so some of the patients are not fully satisfied with that. So probably it's uh, in surgical patients good for follow up, but not for the initial uh, workup evaluation explaining the surgical procedure. I think that's been our experience uh, with our patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you. So I have one question, sir. Uh, this we haven't seen any payment gateway in your uh, app. Is it uh, the paid consultations or we don't charge? Yeah, that's so. That's because our system is a government-funded hospital, uh, so there are no charges uh, uh, for the patients. So it's completely the uh, treatment consultation. Everything is free of charge. Okay, uh, time is running, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And yeah. look forward to see you again in the medical working group. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next Thank one. you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I hand over my microphone to my co-chair. Yeah, Continue. Okay. Uh, next presentation is from Russian Federation, uh, Professor Roman Kiev. Uh, he is from Yaroslavy Regional Cancer uh, Hospital. So uh, his topic is about telemedicine and information technology in medical education. Dr. Roman, please. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. So first of all, I would like to express my appreciation to organizing committee for kind invitation to this uh, uh, Asia Telemedicine Symposium, the big annual event on telemedicine. And my topic is telemedicine and information technologies in medical education. So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated and expanded the adoption of telemedicine globally. In all part of our life, actually, not me not only medicine, but all, uh, all issues of our daily life. And of course, uh, telemedicine is not only about medical care. Uh, according to WHO definition, telemedicine uh, is the delivery of health care services where the distance is the critical factor by all health care professionals using informational information technologies for the following purposes. The first is, uh, of course, medical care. The second one is research and evaluation. And the third one is continuing education. So the education is very important, was crucial important at the, in the era of uh, COVID-19, where we were not 
able to go to face-to-face -face meeting classes, lectures, etc. So telemedicine and medical education uh, could provide remote education and online training. Me uh, also medical events with telemedicine technologies and clinical case teleconferences. So let's start with the uh, issue of remote education and online training. Uh, different universities, uh, of course, uh, try to uh, make uh, an online training for doctors and organize remote education. And also our chair, the gastroenterology chair of Pirogov Russian National Research Medical University, also have the wide broad of remote education courses, lectures, seminars, workshops, all, all uh, traditional face-to-face -face, uh, format uh, educational um, classes were uh, uh, were was provided by remote uh, communications and uh, telemedicine uh, technologies. And uh, of course, uh, online training is important for doctors in the low prevalence countries in the regions of our world with the low prevalence of the disease. According to uh, European Society of Gastrointer Gastrointestinal Endoscopy position statement in curriculum, uh, uh, we have such problem. And ESG suggests that for disease with the low prevalence, online training should be considered a, a good alternative to on-site training to achieve and maintain competence especially in Europe where the uh, prevalence of, for example, gastric cancer is quite low and doctor could not achieve some uh, uh, appropriate number of uh, cases in a year. Moreover, there were no appropriate training centers with appropriate number of cases for training. And uh, of course, the a good solution is to use online um, training courses. One of the uh, interesting example of e-learning uh, system for uh, remote education is the e-learning system for diagnosis of early gastric cancer developed by Professor Ken Shiyao. Uh, it is uh, now it is available worldwide uh, so every doctor can uh, go to this site and uh, Mm, uh, undo, undergo the training course in detection of early gastric cancer. Of course, medical events with telemedicine technologies uh, uh, is, um, uh, is one of the most important thing in uh, medical education of doctors. And we use telemedicine technologies for a long time. But uh, at the COVID-19 era, we have a limited participants in the Congress Hall, and we need to develop uh, novel uh, connections with the participants, but also with the remote centers, participants who uh, take part as a, a clinical center. This is the example of uh, our annual meeting in Yaroslav, the Yaroslav Endoscopy Symposium 2020. And we have uh, the main uh, Congress hall with moderators and limited number of participants. Uh, we have remote centers uh, from all over the world, from Europe, from, uh, from China, from, from Japan. And we need first the a uh, good connection from remote center to Congress hall. And also remote participants also uh, uh, important to connect with the Congress hall and uh, broadcasting of the uh, conference, uh, not only for offline participants, limited number of offline participants, but the huge number of remote participants is was very important. And in this, case we need a uh, dedicated technical support team because in, it is some sort of um, uh, TV show or sport event 
the same global event for the technical supporting. And uh, uh, nowadays, uh, we have um, different engineer team that uh, specialized only in medical broadcasting. So one of the uh, company who provided the technical support is DT Medical in our in our country. But uh, also online workshop in the virtual space is also could be very popular. And the format, air, on-air format is also uh, very popular now. Uh, when we have uh, the venue uh, of the conference, not the physical venue, but virtual space. And this is uh, quite easy to organize some sort of conference. For example, uh, the operating room could locate it in one city, moderator could uh, located could be located in other city and participants remote participants and moderators uh, uh, can join us in different cities and sites of the world and uh, uh, in this case we um, uh, it is not important to uh, have a huge engineer team uh, we need more simple solutions and in this case, we have uh, one of the best solution is to use some uh, mobile stations. In our country, uh, uh, the uh, mobile telemedicine stations called DT Telecard is available now. This is a very uh, interesting and easy to use uh, station with connection uh, to endoscopic uh, station and with the uh, availability to broadcast to the internet. It has a high definition camera, web camera and wide screen uh, and with easy connections to the internet and endoscopic devices. And of course, clinical case conferences is a very important format for doctors. It's some sort of medical consultations. However, we uh, discuss every issues of the every issue of the of the challenging case, and it is very uh, important for doctors in terms of education. The one of the example of such uh, teleconferences is Russian Asian Endoscopy Teleconference, uh, provided by Telemedicine Development Center of Asia. Uh, it was started uh, from uh, 2017 after initial visit of Japanese mission from Temdek to our clinic and our university to Yaroslav Regional Cancer Hospital and Yaroslav State Medical University. The Japanese mission consists of uh, Professor Shimizu, uh, Dr. Moriyama and uh, Professor Kenshi Yao. Uh, uh, traditionally, we have the chair, uh, Dr. Tamahika Moriyama, and we have two chair co-chairs, co Professor Kenshiao and uh, me as local organizer. And we have the panel of experts in endoscopy, Kenshiao, Nore Uedo, Tamahika Moriyama, Hiroshi Kashida, and also in pathology. Uh, uh, the well-known pathologist Takashi Yao from Tokyo was the expert in pathology. The conference time is about 60 or 90 minutes. Topics most uh, uh, the, the topics are the challenging cases, cases in different uh, ways, in different uh, issues of in endoscopy. Uh, usually we have two clinical case presentations and frequency every three months. Uh, from 2017 to 2023, we have 19 clinical case teleconferences. We have about 30 connecting institutes, uh, institutions, and the Kyushu University Hospital is the, uh, um, the main center, Yaroslav Regional Cancer Hospital and Russian National Research Medical University is the local Russian centers. Also, Russian Asian Clinical Case Can Teleconference uh, was integrated 
in the framework of different Russian um, uh, workshops. For example, uh, this year, uh, our teleconference was uh, in the framework of Yaroslav Endoscopy Symposium 2023. So what is, why it is important for Russian doctors or even for local doctors, uh, it is good chance uh, for remote consultations on extremely challenging cases. And we, uh, we started to uh, looking for di difficult cases. And uh, the result is we found well-differentiated gastric uh, adenocarcinoma of, of fundi glands, very rare type of uh, gastric cancer with the challenging features in endoscopy and pathology. And it was the first case in Russia and Europe. Also, it is the, the, the uh, space for discussion of novel findings and new ideas. And for example, after several uh, clinical case presentations, we uh, found uh, the new uh, feature of autoimmune gastritis uh, in patients with high risk of neuroendocrine neoplasia development. And it was the first report in the world uh, uh, when we reported this um, uh, feature in, uh, at end of 2022 and this uh, year at APDW 2023. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic really has accelerated and expanded the adoption of telemedicine globally, and we continue use, uh, using telemedicine after the COVID-19 era. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, any comment or uh, question from the floor? Oh, okay. So, Maria, my one question. Thank you, Roman, for your nice presentation. So, but I, I just have a one question. Uh, as you, most of you guys already know the Navy, the conference has two styles. One is webinar. The another is a case discussion. Uh, in regarding the Russian tech conference, we more focused on the case discussion. So. Uh, I just would like to know your opinion, which is better, case discussion or webinars? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, according to our opinion, opinion of our group, uh, clinical case discussion is the most practical and most important for our local Russian doctors. Uh, of course, webinars with theory is all is also important however uh, as you know during our regular tem deck teleconferences we also incorporated the slides with theory and explanation uh, in our discussion so it's extremely practical the to to have a clinical case discussion yes okay thank you we have time no, okay, because of time limited, I would like to thank uh, Professor Roman for sharing your experience in telemedicine and uh, education and training in Russia. So thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, let's move to the last presentation from uh, Dr. Yumiko uh, Kamokawa. She is now the uh, Chief Director of Non-Profit Organization Haigen in uh, uh, Tokyo, Japan. So today, her topic is uh, Cancer Prevention by Telemedicine in Bhutan. Okay, Professor uh, Kamogawa, please. Can I start? Can you see the uh, picture? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Kamugawa from NPO Higan, Japan. First of all, I would like to say thanks to Temdek for giving me the opportunity to speak our activities. So our non-profit non organiza organization was established in 2016 with three, about 30 gastroenterologists and others. 
our aim of the activity is to reduce the gastric cancer deaths in the world. For this purpose, we started to provide the materials from our home bases. In order to reduce the gastric cancer deaths, we made two strategies below. One is a uh, first is a preventive measure to reduce the bacterial helicobacter pyrrole infection. That is one of the major cause of the gastric cancer by drug administration. The second is uh, to help to find the early gastric cancer by endoscopy. As you know, when the gastric cancer is found in early stage, the cure rate is very high. Moreover, not only operation, but also the endoscopic resection is possible in our stage. However, it is needed to certain uh, training, oops, certain trainings uh, to find our gastric cancer. And then uh, at the beginning, we started the project in Bhutan because Bhutan is a small country and known to be very happy country. However, it was known to be a high incidence of the gastric cancer and uh, existence of high uh, late of the toxic helicobacter pylori. In addition, only very few endoscopists in the whole Bhutan and no screening program was existed when we started. Then we decided to start to work in Bhutan with uh, supported by the JICA for the pilot study in one of the village and provide hands-on endoscopic training to the uh, Bhutanese doctors. This was reported in the newspaper and the TV, so that it tells how serious the problem was in Bhutan. So here, this is a whole scheme for the pilot study in Bhutan. Uh, we choose one of the village, about 1,000 uh, inhabitants, and start to check the helicobacter pylori uh, and pepsinogen in order to clarify the risk for the cancer. Then uh, pyrrole positive group are under the endoscopy test and then gives eradication drugs. At the end, eradication was uh, checked by UBT test. Um, the results were impressive. The infection rate was quite high and 20% of them are the gastric cancer risk. So, um, we provide the uh, eradication drug from the Japanese pharmaceutical company for one week PPI, clarisomycin, amoxicillin therapy. Then uh, endoscopic screening was performed and a high number of the cancer and then you also was found in this bridge. And then we, in this time, we make sure everybody has a, a right time to uh, not forget to take a medicine, we call each, each individual uh, families have a uh, drug or not for one week. And then uh, uh, these uh, early gastric cancer was found, four cases of early gastric cancer was found in this village. And then it was uh, cured by uh, operation. At that time, we have a no, uh, they have a no, uh, chance to do the endoscopic uh, operation. And then strategy two is a train the trainer program for the endoscopist. I think many of them knows uh, TTT. And then uh, in this time, we choose the eight doctors from the Bhutanese uh, doctors. And then uh, as you know, the. Um, we started to the work in the uh, Jigme Dolby uh, National Referral Hospital in Bhutan. And then endoscopy uh, expert, Professor Ken Xiao, uh, was there and started to do the hands-on training. And these are yeah. Bhutanese doctors at the JGW uh, hospital, and then also nurses as well. Then uh, we started and we are exciting to do the uh, conference. However, uh, this uh, COVID-19 was coming down and then uh, lockdown, uh, Bhutan was locked down and the all movement were canceled. So what can we do? And then uh, 
we decided we consulted and then uh, Temedic Kyushu University helped us to do the organized teleconference between Bhutan and then Japan. And then uh, teleconference planning was uh, below two lectures and the case discussions. Uh, luckily, lectures were already done with uh, Professor Yao Kenshi Yao, and then we focused to that case discussion for together with endoscopist and then the pathologist by uh, via internet. Oops. Then uh, the so Bhutan has a three major hospital. Uh, and an endoscopist from all of the all of them joined this session. Japanese sites are uh, Institute from Fukuoka, uh, Professor Yao, on the Junkendo Professor Takashi Yao, and then Alain Fio, and the others. Uh, this conference, case conference, were consisted with endoscopists and the pathologists from both sides for each three months. Uh, as I showed, probably uh, everybody knows that. Uh, Bhutan doctors showed their cases from the endoscopy and the pathology data on the screen. Then Japanese experts try to diagnose the subjective region and sometimes write uh, area into the photos to show the region. This was a good exercise for the diagnosis. And uh, this is a fair conference. However, that uh, also a uh, Russian professor suggested, uh, showed, we had a uh, educational uh, program for e-learning. So um, the other way to continue our study, we provide e-learning from our diagnosis of the gastric cancer from our homepage. This was invented by our direct, one of the director, uh, Professor Ken Shiao. Then now 71 countries and then about 1,799 doctors are joining and learning with uh, our e-learnings. So what should we learn from e-learning? Technology, uh, technique, and the knowledge, and the experience. Even some uh, institutes do not have many cases of endoscopy, uh, but you can learn from the 100 uh, early gastric cancer cases from the e-learning. So uh, e-learning is showing endoscopic picture as a question. And the learner has to be answer, has to answer in this cancer or not, and where the region is. In this way, you can experience many from the e-learning. And e we also provide the uh, educational video from our home pages. And not only Japanese doctors, but also the other um, uh, countries' doctors are giving a lecture. For example, Professor Graham, who is famous for the Helicobacter pylori, and then former IARC Dr. Helero was talking about the Helicobacter pylori, and the others as well. And um, uh, in this uh, time past, and then in 2023, first case report uh, after the six years, uh, after the first uh, case of the early gastric cancer was reported by the Bhutanese doctors. And um, this was very, uh, it was very, really big news for us. And moreover, um, our pilot pro project was followed by the national uh, flagship program in Bhutan in 2022. So certain age of inhabitants were tested for Helicobacter pylori eradication and went to the endoscopy for the screening all over, the, all over in Bhutan. This was a really big um, movement for, for Bhutan and then we really glad to hear to expand our activity. And at the end, these four years activity were supported by JICA and the uh, expansion of the activity in Bhutan was due to a good communication with the Bhutan government, especially uh, Dr. Rote, who is uh, uh, also one of the best endo endoscopists in Bhutan and then become a prime minister in Bhutan. 
Uh, and of course, this was not able to done by support from Temedic Kyushu University. And thank you very much for your attention and please visit our homepage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions or any comment from the floor. Uh, Professor Moriyama. Thank you, Kamago Sensei, uh, for excellent presentation about your activities for Bhutan. Uh, you also provide an e-learning program for those kinds of doctors in the developing countries. So, but I just wonder which is better for those kind of guys, uh, the e-learning program or these kinds of tech conference. I think both is necessary. E-learning, you can do it uh, by yourself at uh, home or at uh, some institute. However, it's real case, uh, case study is very important to, uh, to find out which is a uh, right way or which is a uh, right region. And then how do you think you can discuss? Discussion is also very important, I think. Thank you so much. Any question? Uh, I have uh, some question about the the result of the like uh, incident of the gastric cancer in Bhutan after mm -hmm. your uh, training program. Can you share us about the result or yeah. the uh, death rate of the patient or the late success rate of the early detection or anything else? Can you see or? Yes. Can Can you share us the the result after the training program or e learning? Uh -huh. after, okay. Uh, that you had done in the Bhutan. Yeah, we uh basically we have done for uh TTT as well as a case conference and e learning, and then uh the skill for the detection is uh. We, we cannot really evaluate. However, we found uh, one of the Bhutanese doctors found the early gastric cancer that was uh, big. Uh, no, two, two of the uh, Bhutanese doctors can find the early gastric cancer. That was the uh, actual result. And we haven't uh, checked the uh, test after the e-learning. So right now we cannot tell, but we can check uh, later on. Uh, is there any specific reason to uh, choose Bhutan for this project uh, because of the population or the prevalence? Yeah, at the, at the beginning of 2012, when we started uh, and then we saw the uh, WHO program, the Bhutan was the second, uh, most, uh, second biggest number of the uh, incidents, incidents of the gastric cancer. Right now, I think that's uh, eight. Uh, however, at that time, very high number of the uh, gastric cancer, and as well as uh, very few number of the uh, endoscopics existed in uh, Bhutan. Uh, and moreover, uh, Professor uh, Ken, Professor uh, Ta Professor Yamaoka checks the uh, the toxicity of the Helicobacter pylori in Bhutan that is very high and it's similar to Japan. Kawei is uh, highly positive in Bhutan's uh, cases. Okay, because of limited time. So thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Professor thank you. So I would like to thank all speaker for the presentation and my co-chair uh, for Help me to introduce uh, the speaker. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to announce closing this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are reaching out the, the last session. Thank you. And the next session is International Telemedicine Activity 3. Yeah, it's the same theme following a previous session. And the 
please welcome the chairperson, Dr. Bitun Kinwa-san Watanagun, <laughs> associate professor and the Sirira Cancer Center in Taiwan. And the Dr. Taiki Moriyama, Seiryo Vice President. Vice Director of the Seiryo Iwasato Hospital of Japan. Okay, in this session, each paper in, is out of the 12 minutes. And the further three minutes are available, available for the question and the discussion. Time is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. So finally, we come across to the last session. I think everybody feel a little bit tired and looking forward for the dinner. All right. Okay, let's start from the first session, uh, first topic about the utilization of dental sessions at APAN conferences for education and community development. That can be presented by uh, Dr. Asa Aksa uh, Sahada Oki. He's a head of the oral biology the, the Faculty of uh, Dental Medicine and uh, in uh, Alanka uh, University, Indonesia. Please give him a warm welcome, please. Yeah. Thank you, moderator. Uh, may I share my PowerPoint from my side? Thank you. Uh, it's very <clears throat> happy to, very glad to see you again, uh, everyone in Temdek, my close friends, my colleagues in Temdek. This time, I would like to share our experience to uh, utilize and to add more uh, value of dental session at APAN conference for education and community development in our faculty. Uh, like other world of university and our university also we have to you know increase our activity to contribute more in order to uh, improve our position and uh, university uh, ranking in the world it also happened in my university so every activity of uh, the lecturer or, or the professor uh, in the faculty should contribute uh, to the improvement of the world university ranking of the university. So after we start to be recognized, to be, uh, we start to organize a dental session at a conference for the first time in 2016. Uh, at the time, uh, Professor Suji Simitsu gave me an opportunity to develop uh, the dental session at the Upan Conference. And from the time, uh, every year, or, or every, not every year, every Upan Conference, the dental session uh, was organized by the Faculty of Dental Medicine of Universitas Erlanga in Surabaya. <clears throat> uh, me, uh, at uh, at the as the person in charge to organize the dental session. After 2016, uh, from the 2017 until 2020, we regularly organized a dental, dental session in happen conference. Only collaboration, only you know, organizing, only you know, connecting institution, sharing uh, knowledge, sharing experience. You know. No added value for improved faculty achievement. Yeah, no added value for faculty improved faculty achievement. Uh, so we, I was you know I was challenged by the dean at the time. Uh, can you make? He, he he told me he asked me that can you make some innovation to improve the dentalization at upon conference to you know to bring more added value 
to, to, to bring more added value to improve the faculty achievement. We were challenged to the very tough condition. So uh, during the during the time, uh, only collaboration, but after the COVID uh, pandemic, we start we start the innovation by formalizing the dental session at upper meetings at the part of our education scheme. We started to arrange the hybrid session. So the program not only you know uh, connect connection between institution for the upper conference and sharing knowledge, but the program became a, a structure of education integrated part of our education. So the program must be attended by the students because it is the part of our lectures. It's the part of our curriculum. Yeah. So all the students are and all the professors that is related to the topic of the uh, session of the dental session must attend in person offline. Yeah. Uh, to to fulfill the requirement because it became uh, a part of our educational curriculum. Then, okay, the second value is the invited speaker were arranged as our staff inbound and academic peer list. So after we invited the speakers, we uh, we offer them to be staff inbound and we offer them to be our academic queries and uh, they were you know followed by other activities such as uh, collaboration in research and publication and some other activities from 2022 we expanded the program to be an international community development we published the session to some dental communities in Indonesia, and surprisingly, the attendance number increased significantly, increased uh, dramatically, because it is recognized as a international community development. Then the attendance, not only the faculty member and the student, but also Indonesian dentists, yeah? Indonesian dentists that you know you they need some uh, knowledge they need to to improve and um, to get some uh, to update their knowledge eh? and they need to 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 register the activity and they attend the dental session in uh, upon conference start from 2020 and then we can see the the number of the attendant after we apply our policy to be a hybrid session from online session from 2016 until 2020 start from the 2021 the innovation were, were applied the innovation uh, you know to take place and then we can see the increased number of audience yeah this this is the the, the sample of uh the sample of, of the activity we you can see here in some uh in universal erlanga site here you can see it is uh, it was a uh, an offline activity it is attended by the student in person why, why they need to attend the the session in person because the session became a part of their education became the part of their teaching curriculum yeah so everyone must attend the session because it's a mandatory this is the flow of our work once after TEMDEC announced upon conference, so the dental session organizer, that is me, coordinates with TEMDEC, and then the dental session organizer invites some speakers, and the dental session organizer coordinates with 
academic edu or education affair in the faculty to you know to synchronize the the subject that should attend uh, should uh, uh, synchronize the subject that you know related to the topic here yeah? and the, the teacher will you know invite all the students to attend the the conference the open conference in person later and then the dentalization organizer announced program to the dental community in Indonesia. It it, it is an Indonesian Dental Association or PDGI, Persatuan Dr. Gigi Indonesia in Indonesian language, Indonesian Dental Association. So the member of Indonesian Dental Association uh, <coughs> get the message that uh, it is a uh, happen conference and dental session and uh, it is. Uh, very important for them to upgrade their knowledge and everything. And then they became uh, a participant. And then the organization organizer open online registration for everyone. And then the organization organizer received a letter of assignment from the dean. So you can see here that you uh, formal, yeah, it's a letter of assignment from the dean. So the faculty recognized this activity for both for education and for uh, community development. And then uh, the dentalization of Epan Conference take place in this help. And then finally, the faculty issues a certi certificates for everyone that attend the Epan session online, both online and offline. Yeah? The program and activity is recognized as academic activity and international community development by the faculty. Yeah. Then, what is the, the added value of this uh, innovation? With the innovation, a pan session at dental conference will, you know, result some value or benefit, such as staff info, academic values, education, research, and publication and international community development yeah and this value contribute the university to get this achievement yeah we became the number uh the rank 345 at ks world university ranking in this year yeah so the the activity of uh, dentalization at Kaapan Conference contribute the, the achievement. Then it increase value and benefit of the data session and at Kaapan Conference. Yeah. Uh, after the the activity, we we announce some uh, feedback. Yeah. We we will want to get some bit feedback. So by survey, and we can see here that most of our attendants think that. The activity may improve dental education quality and it also supports the community development. The conclusion is the dentalization of Upon Conference, which are regularly organized by the collaboration of the faculty of the Langa and Temdek, result in some values and benefits. The first one is improving dental education quality for the involved, involved institution as the student gain wonderful learning experience. Number two, support community development as the program disseminate knowledge for Indonesian dentists and empower the community. Number three, the program uh, contribute to build collaboration between connected institutions at the conference. And number four, result outcome in terms of staff inbound and staff outbound and student outbound. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last year, uh, the, the faculty uh, dean visited Temdek, and they also visited uh, Dr. Moriyama and staffs and friends because of our collaboration, our sustained collaboration like this. And finally, I prepare uh, a paper. And it is ready to be submitted. This is a manuscript uh, in the early of uh, the year of 2024. 
We thank to Professor Suji Simitsu as the former of uh, director of Tandek, and then also Dr. Moriyama, Dr. Guriku Kudu, also Dr. Sindaro Ueda, Dr. Sunda Tomimatsu, all everyone, all colleagues, you love colleagues and Tandek. Thank you for the collaboration, and uh, we hope that our collaboration uh, we will be uh, increased in quality in the upcoming years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question from the floor? Please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aksa, for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Kuriko uh, from Temdek, and also uh, thank you very much for nicely organizing the dental session, EPA dental session, every time. And uh, we, I'm really uh, inspired uh, by you. Uh, you are trying to uh, get the benefit. Uh, connecting the, the this act, your activity to get the benefit. So, do you have any tips or you have any work for uh, uh, this uh, this kind of thing? For example, uh, you are trying to uh, visual um, vi visualize or, uh, your poster or yeah some some uh, yeah uh, effort. If you have uh, yeah, we like to hear. Uh, you are muted. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the story has not just happened because we faced some tough condition between 20, with, uh, in the first years that we, we, I, I, inf I was involved in this activity because the faculty at the time did not recognize it as a as a beneficial activity for for improving the faculty uh, value, so I was challenged by everyone at the time that your this activity should should bring or should result some benefits, some some added benefits, some value that should contribute to the university achievement. Yeah, that is not easy at the time, but. Uh, I talked to Professor Suji Simitsu at the time, and uh, he give give me a uh, you know some uh, he he give me some spirit here, some spirit, and he he pushed me to do to keep doing uh, and to prove everyone that this activity may result some benefit. And so uh, after pandemic, uh, I start to uh, introduce some uh, innovation at, that I uh, told you already earlier. And uh, thank, thank God that uh, it uh, results some uh, significant improvement. Yeah, so everyone now recognize the upon meeting, recognize the dental session, everyone in Indonesian Dental Association. So everyone wants to join, everyone wants to register, to attend. Yeah. Then so how, uh, your question is how, how to how to attract the the Indonesian Dental Association to to, to join the upon meeting. Okay. Uh, of course I we, we 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 develop or we made some uh, poster yeah and we collaborate with with some with Indonesian Dental Association to make uh, assure that that this activity is uh, beneficial for Indonesian dentists. Then now everyone in Indonesia join want to join this activity. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for yeah information and effort. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Right, thank you very much to share us the uh, how to change the uh, crisis turned it to be the opportunity. Right, uh, please give the big hand to Professor Oki, please. So we can continue the next one. Okay, 
the, let's move on the next presentation. Uh, telemedicine activities updates in Korea, uh, spoken by Mr. Sang Yun Kim. Uh, he's a former staff of Tain Corporation Center, South Korea. Just a minute to be ready. Let us stop. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sang Kim from Korea. And I'm really delighted to, to be here then to see a lot of friends to to having time with for the 20 years. So my duty is just try to finish my presentation as soon as possible. <laughs> and actually, when I when I arrive here, then I just uh, surprised to see that a lot of people are here. So I just kind of nervous to preparing my presentation material is better than better. And the audience is getting a smaller and smaller. So <laughs> I'm sort of leaving right now. So actually, my presentation will be kind of the, my my own story and uh, kind of the history of Korea telemedicine society and uh, <clears throat> my some considerations for the community. So, um, who and when starting the telemedicine activity in Korea? Actually, there are the in in fact the telemedicine itself has covered a lot of dimensions. Only not only for the live surgery, there are data science and and uh, there are music processing. So my presentation will be kind of limited for the live surgery and related activities. The back to the year two thousand two, uh, actually I was uh sorry I I didn't I missed my pre I mean introduction myself. And actually, <laughs> actually. Most of you are know know me yeah. very well, but actually I started my career from year two thousand three, and starting my support for the, this kind of telemedicine services more than twenty years. And right now I just moved to another field, so I now I just building the financial service for the people. So uh, in in terms of the telemedicine activity was held in before the 20, two thousand two. In, in kind of the small uh, divisions, but in real, with the connection with the research and education network, we I consider the 2002 a kind of starting point. And at the time that we have, uh, there are some pioneers. So they only have a general surgery part is participating in with the lap lap uh, laparoscopic surgery. So Dr. Han and Dr. Kim and NCC are participating of this, the early initial stage. And we also have partners, so PEMDEC and the APEN Working Group, Telemedicine uh, Medicine Working Group, it was kind of our partners. And I started my career from year 2003. And at the time, our activities are more focused on the surgery, um, live, live surgery with the technical challenges because we only have a DBTS and we stick to do them and uh, we are figure out how to be connecting the each machine and uh, uh, display and sort of things are real kind of our 
cormorant at the time. But, and as the time goes by, year 2009, our, the internal medicine association is participating in it. So the, the community itself is boosted. So we have various live surgeries and uh, meetings are uh, happen. Actually, I tried to find some good pictures, but I, some of them are already lost. So, so, and after pandemic, the telemedicine activities still grow. Uh, so in, in, in one part, a government of research, a uh, government approach is just based on the significant development of technology that they try to cover the, the coverage for the rural area, the effectiveness of telemedicine services. So let me give you some uh, example of a commercial approach. Uh, this is one thing for the detectable the health tractor. Uh, they have a kind of tracking the heart rate information, blood pressure trends, and per pressure oxygen saturation levels, or so on. And those kind of hardware the development in, in Korea, and I, I, maybe it also happened in your countries, or they are trying to have more uh, the devices. And they also have uh, some, another example for the brain's with brain health. And the one soft time is they have a bit, bit rust plus. It's kind of portable body composition analyzer that makes it easier to check the patient's body metric. So um, our previous work is kind of trying to deliver our activity through the network. But as time goes by, there's a lot of commercial players are building their own product or services to the making this telemedicine activity more broader. And now I just try to show up some update the activity in 2023, because I, even though I leave the system main, I personally participating, I was kind of technical advisor for the, uh, the community. So we have a uh, IDEN 2023 was held in June uh, there's uh, many uh, countries are participating in it. And here, I I also communicate with Satya <laughs> and some of some are from the Thailand. And the, yeah, for, for the demonstration, yeah. Actually, Chiang Chia Sang was not there, but actually I was, I could collaborate with the colleague of Chiang Sang. And another domestic uh, event was KSGE days. Uh, at the time, it's a kind of domestic one, but we collaborate with the, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, right now, we have uh, more than, I, I'm not counted, but uh, more than many, many university and uh, the companies are connected to the research and education network. But rather than that, based on the, on the only commercial network can be useful for the, their uh, telemedicine activities. And I just try to give you some interactions in the, in the telemedicine and doctor to doctor and doctor to nurse to patients and the public rural. So we have the very, very variety of the dimensions for the, this telemedicine uh, field. But, and there are some additional technology, so AL and BL and uh, AI technology is also involved. So we have a lot of choices and events and examples. So let me give you some some images. So eight remote seminar and consultations, and uh, at, at operation room we using the AI or BL technologies, and we also trying to uh, share some medical medical big data, and we also trying to uh, remote medical services. Actually, though, actually do these these uh, images are just I just built through the AI service. <laughs> You name it, okay. So, so I've thought about the during 20 years, the network itself is we are in in, in Korea we can use an, uh, more than one gig network, and some some people are using 2.5 gig, and we have promotion service for 10 gig service in in the in household. So network itself is quite enough. So we still, so, and in terms of network. We, are, we, we didn't have any uh, problem on that. 
in, in case of application and online and mobile communication is kind of normal and digitalization is inevitable trends. So we need to go there. And another technology is substantially changing the, this medical fields. But the people, we aged 20 years, right? Including me. And some retired, some are uh, left up here, and some has moved to the other fields like me. And the community have been sizing up during the period, but at the same time, we feel that the community itself is, the size is getting a kind of the stock, and the size of it's stock. We don't make a kind of big one. And the people are taking, taking granted the network itself is always there. So the getting faded, the importance of network and, and the using the various commercialized easy go applications for the medical activities. So, so some services and uh, technology is already there, but due to the political, uh, well, our legal issues, we cannot doing it. And it, I mean, it depends on the country's situations. And let, let me try to give a one, the three trend for the global remote medical service ecosystem. We increase the life expectancy. So we will live long. Because of that, we will have uh, some chronic diseases. And at the same time, we also facing some shortage of healthcare professional like you. So it's clear that we must change the way of the we deliver healthcare. So I think this is the reason why we are here and we why we are uh, maintaining our collaboration for the long time. So, so thank you. And we can we can handle I mean, we can gathering here, then we will go to the good future. And I'm really delighted to be here for the deliver my speech. I'm not sure I can I can participate in later, but anyway. <laughs> I try to I try to personally to communicate with you for 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 a time being and okay thank you for your time and yeah this is it thank you thank you very much for your nice <laughs> presentation <laughs> uh, and uh, oh this this mic uh, yeah, so very nice presentation uh, the, of the, your activities and the much efforts for 20 years. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, do you have any questions? Please don't. Any comments? Me? <laughs> <laughs> Ming, Dr. Ming-san, please. Hi, Sang Yu Kim. Yes. Yeah, uh, I just want to say something to uh, Ms. Kim. Uh, so I I uh, can't remember uh, how many here we have. The, work uh, together but um uh, really uh 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 appreciate for your support and i think um so far the uh, network uh, uh, technology and the uh, um uh, technology for telemedicine and uh, very developed now and but i think uh, the uh, role of the uh, networking uh, network uh, engineer is uh, still very important. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, so, um, and of course the the uh, uh, networking network uh, engineer is always behind. And yeah. uh, so far, uh, I I remember the old time we used to meet the uh, kind of like, um, VPN. Or uh, we always need to uh, the the private uh, network uh, for do uh, for doing uh, 
uh, telemedicine. So we only need to uh, uh, make a good uh, routing between uh, country. Uh, so uh, uh, I try to find some uh, uh, photo between us or uh, uh, telemedicine all time, but uh, <laughs> I cannot find it. Uh, uh, and uh, the last uh, word um, is uh, very, uh, what a PT, you, uh, now you move and uh, we don't have the uh, opportunity to work uh, together. So uh, please keep in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Min. I just don't know what is question and what is answer. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, to inspire us of a long journal of telemedicine in Korea. So please give him a, a warm welcome. Right. Finally, we just arrived to the last speaker of the session and also of the day. Uh, Dr. Sheila Chod is from Sangara uh, Netheraya in India, going to present about the tele ophthalmology in primary care in India. Please. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. I'll share my presentation. My topic for today is teleophthalmology in primary care in India. I'm from Chennai, Tamil Nadu, from Shankarnath. I head the teleophthalmology department. I do not have any financial disclosures. Can you hear me now? The ground rules for COVID is in 2020, COVID came in and there has been a lot of implementation of telemedicine and teleophthalmology world over. India brought in the telemedicine practice guidelines in March 2020 to enable the practice of telemedicine in India. Now, healthcare availability in India, population of more than 138 crores besides Should we share from this side? Ah, you are muted. We are ready to share your slide. Ah, you are still muted. We can share your slide. Okay, fine. We have shared the slides. Can I start the presentation again? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a moment, please. Okay. 
En staat van de verslede? Kan je staat van de verslede? Ah, excuse me? En staat de presentatie? Is dat de presentatie? We already start up your presentation. Can you share? Can you start the presentation? You, you, you can't, you can't see your presentation in your venue. I can see the presentation. Can I start the presentation? Yes, please. And you can, please. Yes. Please so start. Already start the presentation. So let's say next. Then we will. Yeah, my topic is teleophthalmology in primary care. Then financial disclosure. Due to pandemic of uh, COVID-19, there has been social distancing and telemedicine was implemented world over and teleophthalmology also implementation increased. Next slide, please. Next slide. The Board of Governors in, uh, in India implemented, brought in the telemedicine practice guidelines to implement telemedicine so that everybody will be able to practice. Next slide. Now, the healthcare availability in India is population of more than 138 crores resides in India. 80% of the population resides in rural areas. 70% of the healthcare resources are in urban areas. One ophthalmologist per one lakh population. Next slide. The teleophthalmology mobile unit, we had a bus which had paramedical staff and the equipment. And this from this bus, the paramedical staff dis dismantled the equipment and set it up in a school or a, a large hall. Next slide. Now what this provides is, provides urban facilities to rural areas through mobile teleophthalmology vans. Comprehensive eye examination in rural areas at patient's doorstep with spectacle dispensing. Diabetic retinopathy screening camp, eye screening for school children, camp for post operative patients in villages following surgery at base hospital, pre surgery medicines, transport, boarding, and spectacles for cases that require surgery at the base hospital. Next slide. Now, what is the present manpower we have? We have about four optometrists, three social workers, one braver, one optician one project officer and one funders protocol. Next slide. The present manpower in the sense technic technical coordinator one, information and technology person three, assigned ophthalmologist one. Next slide. Now this is an EMR chart where the demographic details of the patients are present followed by Ophthalmic examination, clinical data are also present. Next. Next slide. Here you see the ocular images. Both anterior segment and posterior segment are taken and uploaded into the electronic medical records. Next slide. The workflow at the campsite. First patient registration is done in the electronic medical records. All demographic details are shown. Then you have um, autorefractor is used to Take the refractive error of the eye, followed by subjective refraction by optometrist. Vision testing is done both for distance and near, followed by slit lamp examination where the anterior segment of the eye is examined and intraocular pressure is measured. Then fundus images are taken. In a fundus image, it is dark adaptation, physiological dilatation, no drops are applied, non midriatic fundus photography with macular fixation and 45 degrees. View of the fundus. Next slide. No teleconsultations are done. We have a central hub in the main hospital with sound proofing is done through indigenous connectivity, where there's a technical coordinator as well as the ophthalmologist. In the, at the camp site, you have a laptop with the optometrist. No spectacle dispensing is also done at the camp site, where the frames are taken. 
intercapillary distance is measured. And then the patient's orders are given and the spectacles are de delivered one week later. The physical fitness, you have the basically blood sugar, blood pressure, pulse, everything is taken. Counseling, we advise the patients, whoever has to come to the hospital, reference are given. They are advised to come to the hospital. Directions are given. Next slide. Now, teleconsultation, Shankar Netralia based hospital ophthalmologist with real time sharing of the images is there. And at the campsite, optometrist with patient, video conferencing at bandwidth above 512 kbps. Next slide. Can you play the video? Just diabetes, hypertension, thyroid, or heart disease, or in case of ocular trauma, any history of previous ocular surgery, and any sort of visual impairment are referred for further fundus examination. The patients who need further referral are then consulted through teleconsultation with the ophthalmologist in the presence of an optometrist. The ophthalmologist reads through the electronic medical record and then looks at the slit lump photograph as well as the fundus photograph taken. If there is a need for further referral, the patients are then refer referred to a higher center for the need for any cataract surgery or any other treatments. You can see clearly the patient from the campsite is talking with the doctor at the base hospital. A clear teleconsultation has been enabled. Next slide. Now in the Tamil Nadu mobile unit from April 2010 to October 2023, about 2,400 camps were conducted. Number of patients examined were 240,000. Number of teleconsultations is more than 5,000 and more than 72,000 spectacles have been issued. Next slide. Now, clinical data is from April 2010 to October 2023. Majority were refractive. It is almost 60% were myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia. Then the cataract surgery, that is about 30,000. Followed by the retinal condition, which is more than 5,000. Then diabetic retinopathy cases, which is more than 2,000. Then we had glaucoma cases, about 840. Then cornea lesions, 1,795. And posterior capsular functioning, about 2,000. Now, if you see the neuro cases, papilledema and others were 300. And spin cases for children was also more than 400 cases. Next slide. Now, an emergency case like a papilledema, we were able to diagnose in a remote rural village and take the patient to the urban area where a neurosurgeon was there and we could help the patient in this situation, critical situation. Next slide. Here, patient, you can see diabetic retinopathy. Patient is a diabetic. And you can see the hard exudate, retinal hemorrhages in both eyes. Next slide. Now, prevalence of diabetes, if you take, diabetics are 563 million, and it's expected to be about 783 million. India is 77 million. That is, one in six adults with diabetes in the world come from India. And epidemiological studies have shown one in three persons with diabetes have diabetic retinopathy, and one in 10 has life threatening diabetic retinopathy. Next slide. Now, diabetic retinopathy is regarded as a side-threatening microvascular complication of diabetes and an important cause for preventable blindness in a population of 563 million diabetic patients worldwide. Prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is 18% to 33% and side-threatening is 5 to 10%. So, what you need is preventive eye care through DR screening because it's a silent killer. So it's very difficult. The patient might lose vision in one eye and he has vision in the other eye. So he, he won't think he has good vision. So it is very, very important that every diabetic patient undergoes annual dilated fundus examination. 
Next slide. So artificial intelligence for diabetic patients to identify and eliminate the 67 to 82% of diabetic patients with no diabetic retinopathy screening by paramedical staff using artificial intelligence. Again, to identify 18 to 30 of diabetic patients with DR using artificial intelligence and follow up reference to the ophthalmologist for further investigations and treatment. And decrease the incidence of new found adult blindness in diabetic patients. Next slide. So artificial intelligence is very useful in rural areas because it is able to identify ocular systemic diseases. Ocular diseases, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, retinopathy of prematurity, optic nerve disease, glaucoma, and cataract. In systemic disease, eye is a window. In Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, in hypertension, and chronic disease, kidney disease, and anemia. But to train the AI, you need large amounts of patient data for predictive models. Next slide. For future implementation, using ultra-wide fundus photography in the telescreening site, implementation of artificial intelligence in telescreening for diabetic retinopathy, utilization of clinical support system with electronic medical records, implementation of 5G network. Next slide. So what does the mobile eye care provide? Services to reach the unreached rural villages in India and prevents visual loss and decreases blindness at a national level. Telemedicine saves the travel and cost to the patient and provides specialist care at their doorsteps. Next slide. I would like to remember our guru and mentor, Dr. Ashish Bhattina, who passed away in 2011-2023. He was the person who implemented teleophthalmology in Shankar Netralia, and he was the first President of the Telemedicine Society of India. Next slide. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Chon. And any questions from the floor? The last question? I guess everybody may might be too tired to ask the question. <laughs> Just thinking about dinner. Right. So thanks a lot for showing us quite a remarkable work, especially uh, during the COVID. And you still carry on, uh, develop the, the telemedicine uh, for the uh, people in primary care in India, isn't it? Yeah, we do that. We have the vans and we do the about 20 camps in a month. Right. So thank you so much. Uh, finally, I would like to close the session. Okay. <laughs>